Yes, I'll give you. Yeah, okay. Hello, can you hear me? Right. Okay. So let's get going. Tonight um, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about genetics, right? And it's particularly important that you 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 grasp what I say today for tomorrow's lecture, which will be on epigenetics, which is now becoming a very exciting field in the 21st century. So now I'm, I actually used. Uh, as a source, this book by Carl Zimmer called She Has Her Mother's Laugh. It's available at exclusives. It's a beautifully written story. Zimmer is a New York Times columnist and he's very, he writes beautifully. So, so now, Zimmer and his wife were going to have a baby. And, uh, and, and, and they went, they were advised to go to a genetic counselor because this is America. And uh, it was a strange thing because from the way I read it, all of us here, uh, as, as, as the progeny of our, of our parents and of our ancestors, would, if we probed or investigated our families widely, we'd find people who had some kind of problem or the other. Now, the, the problem here arose because because he had never ever considered genetics. He had never ever considered matters of heredity. He was just absolutely thrilled that they were going to have a baby. But his, his wife's, his wife's opposite, uh, gynecologist said, now go and see a genetic counselor and have a chat. And so he went and she said to him, what's your background? And he said, I'm Jewish. She said, oh, Jew, Jewish. Uh, there's a lot of uh, familial problems with Jews, you know. And he was quite taken aback, if you read, if you read his, 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 his book. So he says, do you know, there's a lot of Down syndrome, there's a lot of um, Tay-Sachs, there's a lot of Fragile X syndrome, and, you know, these diseases are quite common amongst Jews because of the inbreeding. So he was alarmed. He says, I don't know anything of my background. I don't know of anybody who had Tay-Sachs disease in my, in, my, in my wider family. And this is the question about heredity. You know? And this is what we want to talk about today. Darwin spoke about it in the 19th century, but he didn't have a clue as to how heredity worked. Here's a man who formulated one of the greatest theories in science, the theory of evolution. He didn't know how it worked. Okay, and so um, just to remind you, Tay-Sachs is a neuronal destruction uh, of, in the brain because of a buildup of gangliosides. Gangliosides are lipoproteins that are components of the cell membrane. And if they build up in the neurons, it can cause problems, as you can understand, because nerve impulses won't be able to travel. And Gauch's disease, which is another known disease to be common amongst Jews, is a fat buildup in the spleen and the liver. And there, the accumulation is of sphingolipid, which is another mem cell membrane binding component. But you don't need to know, okay? So the word heredity comes from hereditas Latin. Now we talk about genes. We talk openly about genes. We say, oh, I've got the genes for it, or there's, a, there's good genes there, she should get an A in matric. We talk about genes quite openly. But what is the history of the idea of heredity? Okay? Why did Philip II resemble his father, Charles V? So, if you want to read a lovely book on, on heredity and genes, on, on genes and their history, this is the one, the gene. An Intimate History by Siddhartha Mukherjee. A gene is the basic physical and functional unit of heredity. They're made up of DNA. Genes act as instructions to make molecules called proteins. So if I say, oh my God, you've inherited your father's blue eyes, you've inherited a gene from your father that codes for blue color of the eyes, okay? That's, that's how genes work. So, so proteins are probably our main components that give us our shape and our phenotype, what you can see, and also very important for our bodily function. Now, <clears throat> 
As I said in my previous uh, week's lectures on how to be human, Richard Dawkins wrote The Selfish Gene in 1978. It was a watershed book in biology. I mean, it changed the direction of biological thinking. Now, I just said to you that Charles Darwin when he formulated his theory, he didn't know what the unit of heredity was. He just said characters. He spoke about characters, but he didn't know what the unit of heredity was. When the genetics revolution came about from the 20th century onwards, it actually combined with the theory of evolution and gave that theory a whole lot of support. And so, there was this great synthesis in the, in, 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 in the 20th century, which I'm going to talk about, the great synthesis between modern genetics and Darwin's theories, which has helped us understand a whole lot of our biology. So, genes, he says, are in you and me. They created us body and mind, and their preservation is the ultimate rationale for our existence. They have come a long way, these replicators, we call them genes, and they are our survival machines. And he went on further to say that it was the gene that was the unit for natural selection. Now, this wasn't pleasant. It wasn't pleasant at all, because what, he, what da Dawkins was saying is that we live a life, right? We love, we, 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 we uh, show people affection, we, we feel happiness, or we feel sadness. We work very hard, we try to achieve something, and we call it a life, right? And Dawkins says, we're actually fooling ourselves because there's, the motive behind it is through the gene which just wants to make copies of itself. So if you're happy, you reproduce. So Darwin said that the principles of evolution are survival and reproduction. Once you've reproduced and you've passed on your genes to the next generation, you've served your purpose on this earth. Now modern medicine is keeping us alive for longer and longer and longer. And we keep asking the question, what's the meaning of life? So Richard Dawkins says, meaning of life is what you give it. But just remember, don't be fooled. You're just a, rep you're just a vehicle for a replicating machine. It's not, not nice thinking. But that's the scientific thinking. OK, let's go into some history. The Holy Roman Emperor Charles V at the Palace of Brussels in 1555. Charles V was becoming ill, and he was extremely worried. Now, you notice he was a man who was known for his prominent lower jaw and an elongated face. And Charles V decided that he should pass on the throne to his son. His son, who was Philip II. Okay, now there's no, there was no problem with that. There's no problem like with that in a royal family. But how did you know he was Charles's son? We didn't know about any genetics then, right? Charles said that this is my son, Philip II, and he is going to take the throne from me. He was the rightful heir of Charles V. He inherited the throne from Charles, right? Inherited. It's almost, it's almost like a, a, a genetic thing. But he also had the Habsburg jaw. He inherited that from his father too. Now, if you look at the Habsburg dynasty, they only married amongst themselves to keep the blood pure. So listen to this. Charles was ailing since the 1540s. He had gout. He had hemorrhoids. He was depressed. Philip II, his son, who was going to take over from him, married Maria Manuela, his first cousin. Philip's parents, Charles and Isabella, were first cousins. Maria's parents were Charles and Isabella's siblings. Can you imagine the inbreeding in these royal families? It was just unbelievable. You know, when I lived in England, there was a study done in Bradford where doctors reported that they, they are seeing a lot of children of Pakistani background being admitted to the hospital with a whole lot of genetic disorders. And that can only be because of these first cousinly marriages. And in a lot of these cultures, especially the Indian culture, 
you know that Indians for a long time resisted the idea of uh, old age homes, putting old people into old age homes. So there used to be a matriarch in the family, the granny, and all her children and her grandchildren would live with her. And her, the whole life of that family would revolve around this mat matriarch. And if, if her children had grandchildren, she would decide, okay, these two should get married when they're older. And it was sealed. The arrangement was sealed. So when they grew up and when they were 20 or 25 years old, they were under the impression that we're going to get married because it was decided for us. And that has created a lot of problems in the community. So Philip II and his wife had Don Carlos, and he was born deformed, not surprisingly. The right side of his body was not well developed. He had a limp. He was a bit of a hunchback with a pigeon chest. He had a violent nature. He threw somebody off a top floor once. He, he could not rule. So what does Philip do? He wanted another son, so he goes and remarries his own niece, Anna of Austria. See, this is, has happened. And there have been reports elsewhere. Queen Victoria's family tree had hemophilia. There's Queen Victoria here. She had a gene for hemophilia, but she was a carrier, not a sufferer. And she passed the gene on, and you can see that they were carriers because the mother is usually the carrier who passes the gene on to the son who then suffers. So the round blocks here are the females and the square blocks are the sons. So Victoria's gene, which didn't affect her at all, was passed on to quite a few generations of, of men. All these square boxes are men. So that's just to show you that how these genes are transmitted and how they how they um, manifest themselves, okay? So in hemophilia, now remember, all the men here, your sex chromosomes, your pair, you've inherited one from your father and one from your mother, but you have XY, okay? So you didn't inherit your father's X. If you had, then you would have had a double X and you would have been a woman. Now, so the unaffected father has his XY genes, right? And a carrier mother could, who has two Xs, but is a carrier. She doesn't have the disease because this one's normal, right? Now, if this father, uh, if this father passed on his genes there and that mother passed on her X gene there, this daughter was fine, right? But this mother could pass on that X to a daughter, and that daughter could be a carrier, but not a sufferer, because she's got a normal X to see her through, right? But it's only when this mum passes on her faulty X to her son, and he gets his father's Y chromosome, he's XY, he's male, but he will be hemophiliac. That's how it works. I'm sorry I can't go very much further into this, but it's just to give you an idea, so it would explain how this carrier, Queen Victoria, through future generations, left so many people, so many young men affected, who became sufferers. Okay? Now, so it was Hippocrates. Sorry. I get very thirsty when I speak. It was Hippocrates. Sorry, are you understanding me so far? Okay. Please shout because this is particularly important today. Hippocrates said men and women produced semen that blended offspring had features of mum and dad. And he was very wrong. And then Aristotle came along and he said, only men produce seeds of life which grew on the menstrual blood inside the bodies of women. A woman can influence the traits only in the way that the soil can influence how an acorn can grow into an oak tree. He was wrong. But they were brave. They were thinkers, and that was good. This man, I didn't know how to pronounce his name. How do you say his name? Aeschylus. He was a Greek playwright. He said, the mother is not the true parent of the child, which is called hers. She is a nurse who tends the growth of young, of, of young seed planted by the true parent, the male. He wouldn't get away with it today. Okay? And then there was Louis Mercado. Now just see how this thinking is opening up. He was Philip II's doctor, and in 1605 he wrote a book called De Morbus Hereditatis, on hereditary diseases.
He said people inherit diseases. It was the first time somebody said something like this. Both men and women produced seeds which were combined through sex, which I thought was pretty close to the throat. Okay, now look, here's the man, Charles Darwin, 1859, the origin of species. A, 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 another life-changing book in the history of biology. Not only in the history of biology, in the history of everything, it, it's, it's, its meaning went beyond biology. It went into the philosophies, into the humanities. So Charles Darwin said, there's a blending of characters or hereditary units, like white and red would give pink. So he said there was a blending of the male and the female characters, which was completely wrong. Because your father's gene and your mother's gene for the same protein are called alleles. They don't mix. They stay apart. And they, do, and they express their proteins as they go. In 1868, now, I just want you to take note of this date. In 1868, he proposed his pangenesis theory. And he coined the concept of gemules, minute particles of inheritance thrown off by all cells of the body. Pretty far-fetched he was. The theory suggested that an organism's environment could modify the gemules in any part of the body. Modified gemules would congregate in the reproductive organs of parents to be passed on to their offspring. I mean, this was pretty complicated. But that's what Darwin thought because he didn't know any better. Now, that was 1868. And in 1865, not far from Darwin, who was in Kent in England, came this man, this monk, Gregor Mendel, who actually did the first experiments in genetics. He took peas, right? Yellow peas and green peas. And he, he, he combined them. And they had yellow offspring. All of them yellow. That was the F1 generation. Okay? Then he took seeds from amongst these yellows and he bred another generation. And what he got was three yellows and one green. So the green was in the minority, and the ratio of yellow to green in this F2 generation was 3 to 1. Okay? Then he took these yellows and he tried to mate them with the yellow here, and eventually he found that you either had 25% all yellow, 25% all green, and in 3 to 1 ratios, for the rest, for the rest of the 50%. So what he is saying here, in fact, let's just read it. He said, Mendel crossed yellow and green pea plants. All the peas were yellow, right? I showed you that, F1. All the peas were yellow. That means, although there was a green, yellow was dominant. Okay. Then, he transferred pollen between the F1s, right? The plants were yellow and a fraction of them were green. There were three yellow for every green one. He further crossed F2 yellows with the original parent yellows and the green once again re reappeared in a fraction of the plants. So what he's saying is he, this would be the dominant gene, that would be the recessive gene. So the dominant will show until you carry on breeding and then the recessive one will show. So now in this case, in this case, there were two recessives, that's why they were all green. In this case, there might have been two dominants, that's why they were all yellow. Or there could have been one dominant and one recessive, but the do yellow was the dominant. It's only when the recessive one was twice that you got the green. Now, this became a pattern. This could not ever be disputed. So when modern geneticists took this on, and they did experiments, Mendel was proven right all the time. But I'm talking to you about history. The history is that in 1868, in 1859, Charles Darwin writes his book. He doesn't know what genetics is. In 1868, he postulates a far-fetched theory, which makes no sense. But right close to him in Austria, unfortunately, there was no email in those days. Right close to him in Austria, a monk does the experiments, the definitive experiments, right? 
And then I used this book, Horace Friedlin. There was a man by the name of Irvin Shargaff um, at, at Columbia University, right? He was a professor of biochemistry at Columbia University Medical School. And he came up, he's famous because he came up, of a, came up with a one-to-one -one rule of DNA basis, which I'm going to tell you about just now. We're not quite there yet. Shargaff said, guys, you know what? Okay. Who do you think, or do you want to know who really deserves the major credit for DNA discovery? And he said it was a man by the name of Frederick Meischer in 1871. Now, just look at this. Darwin is in England, Mendel is in Austria, and Maisha is in Switzerland, and they don't talk to each other. <laughs> they didn't read each other's work. So each one had his own view. But Maisha, like Mendel, was coming closer to the truth. He was a Swiss physician and biologist, only 24 years old. He was the first researcher to isolate nucleic acid. Nucleic acid meaning coming from the nucleus of the cell, right? Today we call DNA, RNA in the cell nucleic acid. But he didn't say it was DNA. He didn't say it was RNA. He said it was nucleic acid because it came from the nucleus. Note how close to Darwin and Gregor Mendel these two guys were. Okay, so he said there's something in this nucleus and he isolated it. And he was very interested in it. He wanted more and more material because he, f he, he, he wanted to isolate the nucleic acid. But you know what? He had no idea that it was hereditary material. Okay? So his interest, he wanted to know which chemicals made up the nucleus of a cell. All right? And he also said that cell suspensions were hard to obtain. And nobody knew what the nucleus did, and it was also difficult to extract. This is in 1867. But he knew that white blood cells contained large nuclei. So you know what he did? He went to Turbingen Hospital, and he collected pus of surgical bandages, from surgical bandages. And he isolated the nuclear material from the white blood cells and called it nuclein, because it came from the nucleus. A protein attached to something else, a nucleoprotein. Now, guys, are you with me to this point? Are you really with me? Hello? Can I move, can I move on? Okay. When you say nucleoprotein, right, so he says, I isolated something. There was nucleic acid in it, but there was also a protein attached to it. Okay, so he called it nucleoprotein. Does that make sense to you? Okay, now, it had a lot of phosphorus in it. Okay, so what he had done in 1867 is he had discovered what we know today as DNA as a chemical entity. Okay, now, let's classify all the material that makes up. So if I took a bite of one of you, or I had a piece of steak, whichever, there would be protein in it, lipid, carbohydrate, nucleic acid, vitamins, and minerals and water. That's what makes you. That's what you, what's what you get from that piece of steak that you have. Right. And if he said he had found nuclein in the nucleus of the cell, it was a nucleic acid, which is here, and a protein, which is there, and he called it a nucleic, nucleoprotein or nuclein. Okay. Okay. Now, so this is where his interest lie, lay in the nucleus of the cell. Now, <clears throat> he asked, would nu nuclein function as a genetic substance? He asked that question. For 50 odd years, nobody took any notice. This poor man, he must have died long before that. Okay? It was only in 1943 that Erwin Schrodinger, a physicist, a quantum physicist, wrote a book on what is life. Erwin Schrodinger was a German 
who had to escape from Hitler's Germany because he was being watched as somebody who wasn't supporting the Reich. Okay? He left, he had to leave with his wife and mistress and child, whom he had from the mistress, and he went to Dublin, which he found to be a very boring city. But by then he had done his famous work, okay, and he went to Dublin and he told the authorities there that that child was the child of him and his wife, but it was the child of him and his mistress. And they all lived together happily ever after. Um, he asked this question, what is life? And he said, was it the protein or the nucleic acid of the nuclear protein that was a particle of heredity? Okay. But Maish's paper, when he wrote it and asked this brilliant question, his boss, Hoppe Selye, refused to release the paper and let him, have it, let him publish it. Okay? Now, we're coming close to the end of the 19th century. Richard Altman takes that nucleoprotein, that nuclein, and he separates the protein from the nucleic acid. So he's got purified nucleic acid, but they're still not absolutely sure that this is hereditary material, but he gets Nobel Prize for it in 1912. Then Phoebus Levine, he was an American biochemist who studied the structure and function of nucleic acids. So he characterized the different forms of nucleic acid, DNA, he's, he actually then separated them into DNA and RNA. So you see, you're starting with the nuclear protein, you're removing the protein, then you're starting with the nucleic acid, and then you're separating it into DNA and RNA, and he found that DNA contained adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine, deoxyribose, and a phosphate group in about 1909. Now, these are the components of DNA. Don't get confused by them, because I'm going to put them all together for you in a minute. Okay. Albrecht Cossel found that nuclein contained purines and pyrimidines. I'll tell you what that is too. He won the Nobel Prize in 1910. What I'm taking, doing is taking you stage by stage, and I want you to appreciate the thinking of these people who actually gave us the knowledge we have today about these, these biological things. Okay, so when you say they found the DNA basis, right, and when you say that Cosell found uh, that DNA contains purines and pyrimidines. Listen to this. The DNA is made up of adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Okay. It's a four base alphabet. Can you believe it? Your whole genome, your whole genome in every cell in your body has just four basis. But remember, we have a 26-letter alphabet. How many words can we make from it? Millions? If you change the sequence of words. So over here, although you have only four bases in the DNA alphabet, you can have so many different sequences of the DNA. You can make so many, you can code for so many different proteins. And if you say DNA makes RNA, RNA has the same basis, except it doesn't have thymine, it has uracil. Okay? And I'm going to talk to you about it now. So the purines are adenine and guanine, the pyrimidines are thymine and cytosine, and when you look at your DNA, adenine always links with thymine, and guanine always links with cytosine, and remember I told you about Irvin Shargaff just now and the one-to-one -one ratio? He said, the amount of adenine you'll find in your nucleus in your entire genome equals the amount of thymine. The amount of guanine you find will equal the amount of cytosine. Are you happy? It's getting a bit complicated. Is it all right? Okay. Now, and then what about the other components? A ribose is just a five-carbon sugar, and this is the phosphate. We said it's rich in phosphorus. Here it is. And just now we will see how they all put together. So the nucleic acid had nucleotides. Now, when we talk about a DNA molecule, 
We just don't talk about the bases. We take a base and we put it with its phosphate and its ribose, so we call it a nucleotide. I thought I had a picture of it here, but don't worry. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll show it to you just now. Now, the question is how could these, these phosphates, these ribose, and these bases, how could these transmit billions of hereditary instructions? <laughs> how can it? They didn't know. Remember, this macromolecule was not just dependent on its atomic or molecular constituents, but also on the interrelationships of these constituents. So you had to take all these components and build the gene, and I'll show you how they did it. So like the English alphabet or any other alphabet, with its various combinations forming so many words, so the relatively few different molecules of the macromolecule DNA, by the myriad possible combinations, provide the seemingly simple macromolecule with the means of carrying billions of hereditary messages. So we've reached a point where we are saying that the gene, the DNA, the DNA is our hereditary material. And it is the gene that is transmitted from generation to generation. So what is a gene in relation to DNA? Okay. A gene is a sequence of these bases that expresses for a protein. Got it? Okay. Now, in 1912, Max von Lau, a German physicist, right, he said the exposure of a simple crystal to X-rays resulted in the registration of a specific shadows on a photo photographic plate. So they were now using X-rays. William Rongen had come and gone, and his X-rays. So they were actually doing X-rays of crystals. And Einstein said that's the most beautiful discovery. Then there was a man by the name of William Bragg, right? He said the shadows on the X-ray plate arose from diffraction of the X-rays and the collision with atoms that made up the crystal. So these X-rays were waves, right? And they hit these crystals, okay? And the waves were diffracted and then they were recorded on an X-ray plate. And that's what we see, okay? But his son, William Bragg's son, William Lawrence Bragg, he saw spots and shadows on the film, had an arrangement that was specific for a crystal and allowed the investigation of the spatial structure of the crystal. So you've seen X-ray plates today. You look at the X-ray and it shows you your whole skeleton. And that's exactly what they're talking about. So science and the art of crystallography helps to determine the atomic architecture of any crystal. Right? You guys okay? Okay. Now, here's Fred Griffith. He was a British physician. What he did now, now the real stuff is starting. 1927. He injected mice subcutaneously with a culture of living but harmless pneumococci. Pneumococci are bacteria that cause pneumonia, right? So he injected mice subcutaneously, that means through the skin, with a culture of living but harmless pneumococci, together with the killed species of dead pneumococci. So these were alive, okay? And then he killed some of another species, and he injected them together. The mice died. Why? <clears throat> That was an important question. What did the killed species pass on to the live ones to transform them from a harmless to a toxic strain? It was mice's DNA. You're not looking impressed. Okay, so you got a live species of bacteria. Can you hear me? Right. And it's a harmless one. If I gave it to you, it's pneumococcus, it might not cause pneumonia. But then I've got a species that are harmful. If I gave them to you, right, you would get pneumonia. You're happy with that? But he's taking this, and he's taking the virulent, you call it the virulent, the harmful one. He's killed these. So they're dead now, these bacteria are dead, and he mixes them with the harmless ones, 
and they inject it into the mice and the mice die. That means the harmless stuff, although, it's, although the bacteria were killed, got into the harm, the harmful stuff got into the harmless one which were alive and transformed them into killers. Are you with me? Everybody with me? You happy? Okay. So now, the only conclusion was that this was Maisha's DNA. And Griffith didn't know that the transformed pneumococci will pass on this killer trait to subsequent generations. That means now, these harmless guys who have become killers will make more killers. The next generation will be killers. Okay. Then this man here, 1931, Oswald Theodore Avery at the Rockefeller Institute. He said there's a principle here. The biological properties of any macromolecule depend on the interrelationship of its constituent molecules. 13 years later, in 1944, the year in which Schrodinger wrote his book, What is Life? Oswald Avery focused on DNA. Right? And he dis and I mean, okay. So up to that point, it was thought that only a protein could have been a transforming principle. But they enriched DNA by removing any protein associated with it. So they took the nucleic acid, they took the protein out, killed the pneumococci, and found that the, it was the nucleic acid from the dead pneumococci that transformed the harmless pneumococci. So by now, he has cleared us of all doubts that it was the nucleic acid that was the virulent factor. You want me to say that again? Who wants me to say that again? Okay, you're happy. Okay. So the transforming capability of this DNA was lost when you broke it up by an enzyme called nuclease. That was a brilliant thing to do. So he said, here it is. I know what the transforming principle is, but I'll take it and I'll destroy it and I'll put it back and then it won't work. So I've got all the proof. That's how scientists think. That's why scientists are so arrogant because they think they know the truth because they've got all the evidence for it. Okay, now we've reached a point where we know that nucleic acid is responsible for hereditary. So Rosalind Franklin, this woman, is one of my favorites, but I also feel extremely sorry for her. I mentioned her yesterday. She was an English chemist, I think she was of Jewish background, and an X-ray crystallographer who made contributions to the understanding of the molecular structures of DNA, RNA, viruses, coal, and graphite. She worked at King's College London. Now, when she did, she took this nucleic acid and she did an X-ray of it. Right? She found that it had two strands. It was a double helix, a double helix. And there were two forms, A and B, because, because chemical substances can change by isomerism. I don't want to go into that, but you can get different forms of a specific substance. Okay? But this was one of the most important discoveries, again, in the DNA story. She found that it was a double helix. She worked for this man, Morris Wilkins, right? He was a New Zealand-born British physicist and molecular biologist, right? Whose research contributed to the scientific understanding of phosphorescence, isotope separation, optical microscopy, and X-ray diffraction, and to the development of radar. Now, this is how his life changed. He was at King's College in London. He needed a crystallographer, and he employed Rosalind Franklin. Okay? Now, he also knew these two guys at Cambridge. He was at King's College, and Watson and Crick were at Cambridge, and they were now interested in what the structure of this nucleic acid, particularly DNA, was. Okay, now, she says, an X-ray, this is William Rongen in 1895, he discovered it, is an electromagnetic wave of high energy and very short wavelength, 
which is able to pass through many materials opaque to light. Okay, so we know that. The expert in X-ray diffraction and DNA was Rosalind Franklin in Wilkins' lab. I told you, she was employed by Morris Wilkin, who showed that DNA had a helical structure. It was like a helix. It had two strands. Okay. Franklin refused to share her data, and there is much speculation about how Watson and Crick, who eventually worked out the structure, how did they get her results? Because she wouldn't share it with them. Now this man, Watson, when you get to know him more and more, he's quite a, an unpleasant character. He calls her Rosie in his book, The Double Helix, which you must read. And he's still alive and still making nonsense. He recently made a statement. I mean, I mean here is a man who discovered the structure of DNA, right? And he says, this is the universal alphabet. It's in everything that's alive. So it's in you and me, in your cats and dogs, in, in, in the fish in the ocean, and in all the trees in Kirsten Bosch. DNA, in living material, DNA is the unit of heredity. So you would think that his knowledge in the 1950s, when he made that discovery, would transform him. But about 10 years ago, he was flying from his lab to Oxford to give a speech, and he was interviewed at the airport, and he says, you know what, I think Africans are lesser beings. I, I don't think they, they match us or something. Now, how can a scientist who has discovered the material that is universal in all of us, and that codes for us and that makes us, and not only us, even the plants and the dogs and the cats. He should have had a universal view of life. He should have had an all-embracing view of life. He should have said, it's important for us to live well with each other, and it's important, enough, it's important for us to preserve our environments. He didn't say that. He made a racist remark. So when he got off in England, he was told that his lecture was cancelled. When he went back to America, he was told that his job is cancelled. So now he's floating around. Recently, he sold his his Nobel Prize medal because he wanted to buy a David Hockney painting. So he's quite a character. On his visit to, oh, one more thing about him. He doesn't believe in democracy. Even, even, even his friend Crick, they believe that if you're not an intellectual and you're not producing scientifically, you have no reason to be alive. You're just stealing oxygen. Okay, so that, that cuts off 99% uh, of humanity. On his visit, to Rosalind Franklin's lab to discuss DNA structure. He says, Rosie by then was hardly able to control her temper, and her voice rose as she told me the stupidity of my remarks would be obvious if I would stop blubbering and look at her X-ray evidence. Suddenly, Rosie came from behind the lab bench that separated us and began moving towards me. Fearing that he, in her hot anger she might strike me, I grabbed up the manuscript and retreated to the open door which was, I think, a good thing that happened. Okay, so him and Crick, then when after they saw Rosalind Franklin's helical material, they worked out the structure of DNA. And this is the day scientists discovered the secret of life. That's what he said. And it was discovered not in the Cavendish laboratory where they worked, but they went for lunch every day to a pub. And they actually sat there and worked it out. Now, I've been going to Cambridge for over 25 years because the field of research I was in, all the people in the world met in Cambridge every alternate July. We've been having these meetings since 1990, okay? And we all meet there, and in the evening, everybody wants to take a walk to the pubs. So I usually go with a group that goes to this pub. And I always ask the publican there, the barman, so where do you think they sat? He says, you know what? These, these benches here, are arranged, I have never been uh, moved. They're arranged exactly in the way on that day that they worked out the structure. And they used to sit anywhere. So there you are. James Watson and Francis Crick, they eventually made a wire model of the DNA. There's a long story, and then guess what happens is they go to Sweden, to Stockholm, in 1962 to win the Nobel Prize. Okay? That day is Max Planck, who was a quantum physicist. He won the Nobel Prize in that year, too. She didn't get it. Rosalind Franklin 
was left out. Oh, by the way, it was them, it was them and Morris Wilkins. Rosalind Franklin didn't get it. She had died in 1958 before they could get the Nobel Prize. So and there's no posthumous award. So that was her life, okay? Now, let's take all these components I'm telling you about. I said there were bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. There they are. And I said there was a sugar and a phosphate, and those formed the backbone. So if you look at the DNA structure, it's structured like this. It looks like a ladder, and the bases attached to sugars make a rung, okay? Does it look like a ladder? Okay, and adenine always links with thymine, cytosine with always with guanine. Now, when we said, I said to you, but we don't talk about bases separately, we talk about nucleotides, it's always a base, the sugar, and a phosphate. So if you go back, we talk about thymine with a sugar and a phosphate, that's called a nucleotide, okay? So that's how we talk about structure of DNA. Now, so I said to you, it's a helical structure. That means it's, it's a ladder, but the strands are wound around one another in a form of a helix. And there's the bases, the adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. And if you want to unwind it, it looks like that. And that's, if you want to look at every atom, then that's how it's depicted. Now, we're coming to the most important part of this talk. So this DNA, this double helical molecule, right, which is the unit of your heredity, it can make copies of itself. So it replicates. That means every time a cell is going to divide into two cells, and you must remember, you all started from one cell, and you've become trillions and trillions of cells because of cell division and multiplication, right? But every time cells divide, okay, DNA has to replicate because you have to send the same set of DNA into another cell. Does this make sense to you? Okay, so prior to cell division, DNA has to make a copy of itself. DNA replication, we call it, okay? This follows a template mechanism, okay? More than a dozen enzymes are necessary. It is fast and amazingly accurate. Errors occurring in only about one of a billion nucleotides. Okay, now listen to this. When you make a copy, okay, you need an enzyme. So what you do is you take the DNA and you start unfolding the backbone, right? And then enzyme comes along and makes a copy of this backbone, makes another copy, and they keep making copies of the other template, and they move up and up and up until you have two DNA molecules. Okay, that's replication. The point is that it must be absolutely perfect and precise. And you've got an enzyme that's doing it. It's called DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, which actually makes, helps make this copy of the original strand into two new strands, right? Then there's a fidelity enzyme, which runs along the molecule and checks if every adenine is linked to a thymine and every cytosine is linked to a guanine. And as we get older, we get mutations in those enzymes and we get errors creeping into DNA and then we start feeling the aches and the pains in our muscles and our bones. Okay? So the DNA and the genes that make you will eventually break you. Okay? So that's DNA replication. Are you happy so far? Are you happy? Okay. Now, that all happens in the nucleus of the cell. Right? So DNA is all in there, and the replication takes place there. This is the cytoplasm with all these other organelles, but over there is your DNA material, your nucleic acid. <coughs> now, look at this. This DNA can make a copy of itself, but sometimes it makes a single strand, not a helical, double helix. That single strand is called an RNA. Are you with me? Now, when DNA makes DNA, I told you it's called replication. When DNA makes a copy of a single strand RNA, 
It's called transcription. Okay? Have you taken that down, class? Okay. Now. Now, 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 now. So what I want to tell you is, and I'm going to tell it to you again, I told you the DNA replication takes place here. The DNA may also makes its RNA here, but that RNA leaves the nucleus and it goes to this organelle here called the endoplasmic reticulum. Now this part is smooth, but this part has these little dots because these little dots are called ribosomes. That RNA is going to leave this nucleus and go and sit on the ribosomes of the endoplasmic reticulum in the region of the cytoplasm of the cell. It has left the nucleus. I'm going to say this again just now. It's very important. Okay, so you made your RNA, okay, and the person who actually was one of the leaders in the finding of the RNA was Sidney Brenner, a South African, who did his medicine at Wits. Quite a remarkable man. He was here a few years ago. He's now walking with a walking stick. And he studied at Wits. He did medicine. He came from an extremely poor Jewish home in Johannesburg. He was taken into Wits. And when he, when he finished his medicine, he wasn't given his degree because he was too young. He was exceptionally bright. For he, finding that RNA is made from DNA, him and John Sulston and Robert Ho Hovitz, all of them won the Nobel Prize in 2002 for genetic regulation of organ development and program cell death. That's what the prize was for. Now, this RNA, will you understand that because it's a strand that was made from the DNA, you will understand that it is carrying the information in the DNA with it, with it when it leaves the nucleus. Would you agree with that? Okay, now, so the RNA has all those bases we were talking about in a particular sequence, okay? So the part of the DNA that made the RNA, right, say has a particular sequence of bases, okay? And one of these strands was copied to make an RNA and it now has the information 